Well, February, February is the month of love, right? Valentine's Day, and so we're going to be talking about that over the next couple of weeks. I found a couple of, uh, of uh, interesting love stories that I want to share with you. This is Anna and Boris. Uh, Anna and Boris, their story is interesting. In 1946, they were married, and within three days, Boris had to join the Red Army uh, in Russia, of course, and they were separated. They kissed each other goodbye, thinking they would be apart for a while, but not thinking in any way possible that they would be uh, separated for 60 years. But that's exactly what happened. Shortly after Boris joined the Red Army, Anna's father was declared an enemy of the state, and she and her family were sent into exile. Well, when Boris got out of, uh, when the war was over, he got out of the army. He came to look for her, could not find her, looked for years for her, could not find her, she could not find him. And so eventually their families convinced them to remarry. Her family convinced her to remarry and his did as well. Well, 60 years later, uh, she is in her hometown. Uh, Her family had since returned and all of a sudden she sees a man getting out of a car and instantly recognized that it was Boris. He had come to that village to visit his parents' graves. They saw each other. They immediately embraced. Both of their second spouses had passed away, and 60 years later, they were still in love, got remarried. Uh, Another story, Uh, two other individuals. You know, you hear people talk about, you know, and this is the idea, of course, with marriage is, you know, that one flesh union for a lifetime. Well, Helen and Les Brown are, and you've heard stories similar to this probably, are are an example of how some people actually do spend their whole lives together. They were both born on the same day in the same year. Uh, Eventually, they they were high school sweethearts. Uh, They knew each other pretty much their whole lives. They got married. And then years later, uh, Les was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Pretty soon after, after the disease had progressed, uh, she was uh, diagnosed, Helen was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Well, Les goes into a coma and, and Helen passes away and without even knowing that she had passed away, Les died one day after her. Uh, Mandy's grandparents on her dad's side both passed away within about a month of each other, uh, and both of them bedridden. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's just another example of, of that, that union that husband and wife share. Love stories. We could go on and on and talk about different love stories and how people met and how they stay together. And those are some pretty good love stories. I mean, I enjoy reading those types of things, and I enjoyed those two stories. But as good as those are, it's not the greatest. The greatest love story is the story of God's love for his children. And the Bible is God's love letter from beginning to end about how even, how even though we denied God, we sinned, he loved us enough to provide salvation for us. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be in a series called Matter of the Heart, except for next week, but through, through February. Take a break next week. Brother Caleb's going to be preaching next week. We'll come back, and then we'll follow up with the, the last two installments. And we're looking at God's love for us and what our response to that should be, how that should affect our lives, whether or not it does change our lives. And so we'll look at God's love for us and what our lives should look like as a result. We begin today with God's love. We're looking at Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10. I'll invite you to turn there if you haven't already. We're going to read these verses together. And Psalm 36, I mean, there are several passages in Scripture that describe God's love. But this is, this is a beautiful description of the characteristics of God and and his love as being love. God is love. So follow along with me, verses 5 through 10. This is David, of course, writing this psalm. Lord, your faithful love reaches to heaven, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your judgment's like the deepest sea, Lord. Lord, you, are, you preserve man and beast. God, your faithful love is so valuable that people take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They are filled from the abundance of your house. You let them drink from your refreshing stream. For with you is life's fountain. In your light, we see light. Spread your faithful love over those 
who you know or who know you and your righteousness over the upright in heart. Now, God is love, not just he loves, he is love, so it is his very nature to be a loving God. I mean, we've experienced, those of us who know God through Jesus Christ have experienced his love, and that's why we're here today. I mean, we've come here today to worship the God who has loved us and to express our love to him. If we have hope and meaning and purpose in life, it is only because God loved us, saved us, and set us apart for his service. So we've experienced God's love. He is loving. But talking about God, describing God as love also, is speaking of his character. I mean, God is love, and this is a part that it's not just, again, what he does, it's who he is. And so it begs the question, how much do we really know about the character of God? You can spend your whole life exploring the depths of the character of God and never fully understand who he is. And so over the next couple of weeks today and the next few weeks, we're going to explore the character of God and how that shapes us, our character. Knowing the character of God is essential to living the type of life, Christian life, that we're called to live. Learning, growing in our grace and knowledge of God every single day. So the following from this passage, we're going to look at some characteristics of God's love, which are also a part of his character that will challenge us to live in humility and thankfulness to him. Beginning with God's love is powerful. I mean, the first characteristic we see in this passage is that God's love is powerful. Uh, there is no other, nothing else like it. That word love, look at that word love in verse 5. That, that word the, the Hebrew word there is, is hesed. H-E-S-E-D is the transliteration of that. Uh, hesed. And that literally means steadfast or enduring love. It's used several times in Scripture. It's used to describe in the book of Ruth, Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi, not willing to, not, not willing to leave her to go back to her family, but staying with her and, and dedicating herself. Uh, it's, it's used to describe God's love several times, but, but that word hesed, it's faithful, enduring love. It is steadfast love, and that's why in the Holman uh, uh, translation, it's, it's, it's translated faithful love. Never ending, eternal, faithful, and that is the description of both God's love, but also who he is. I mean, God is faithful. It's who he is. He cannot lie. He will not let you down. If he promises, it will come true. He cannot contradict himself. God is love, and it is his nature, his character, to love eternally, to love faithfully. That word has it. If you look at at these, specifically verses 5 through 7, but even verse 10, this passage of Scripture is bookended by that word. Faithful love surrounds all of these characteristics of who God is. And his love is powerful. The objects of God's love are innumerable. You cannot count the the number of people that God has. I mean, if you tried to count since the beginning of time, the number of people that have been created that that God has loved, it's, it's unimaginable. And even with just the people that are alive today, everybody who's alive, God loves. I believe God loves the whole world, just as his word tells us. Look again at verses 5 and 6. Your faithful love reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your judgments like the deepest sea. Lord, you preserve both man and beast. Put simply... His love reaches to all the world, everybody. I believe God loves every human being. And that's hard for us to imagine, isn't it? It's hard for us to imagine the love of God reaching around the entire world and everybody, him loving everybody equally. But it's kind of like this basketball. If you look at this basketball and this, this index card, if you think about this, And if I were to tell you that I could wrap this index card around this basketball, what would you think? It doesn't look possible, does it? I mean, of course you're going to say yes, or I wouldn't be asking you that question, right? There's got to be a way, right? But 
in and of itself, it's hard for us to imagine. I mean, this is just a car. This is a pretty big basketball, but even, even bigger than this. This was just the, the largest ball at our house, so I borrowed it from Timmy. But it's hard to imagine this happening, but it's possible. I can make this index card wrap around this basketball. Now, y'all bear with me for a minute. The cost of a good illustration takes a few moments. But what we learn in Scripture is not to cut ourselves, no. Um, <laughs> we learn that God's love is immeasurable. I mean, the countless number of people that God does love and continues to love. Just talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I got to concentrate, sorry. <laughs> but God loves the whole world. His love is immeasurable. And we, we trust that, but we can't really understand that. We've experienced that in our own lives, right? I mean, all of us have experienced the love of God in some way. It's just some of us have recognized it, some of us haven't. If you are alive today, it's only because God loves you. If you have breath in your lungs, it's because God loves you. If you have a family, it's because God loves you. If you ate breakfast this morning, it's because God loves you. And the amazing thing to think about is not just that he loves me individually. The amazing thing to think about is, again, his love reaches to all of the entire earth. And just like we can't imagine how this card could ever wrap around this basketball, we can't imagine how God's love could ever reach the whole earth, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. And I will show you in just a few minutes what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> I'm running out of things to say. All right. Are you ready? Who didn't think it was possible, honestly? All right, well, I'm about to prove you wrong. You didn't think it was possible, yet it is. I, I appreciate that. Not original to me, but I appreciate it nonetheless. I'll take it anyway. The point being, you know, our, our finite minds, we cannot comprehend God's love. It's powerful. It's so powerful that there's no way that we can wrap our minds around it. And as long as you live, it doesn't matter how long you live, you will discover new aspects of his love each and every day. But the amazing thing is, is that God loves each and every human being as if they were the only human being alive. It reaches the whole world. God's love is immeasurable. There's no way to measure God's love. There's no way to, to, to put it into some kind of description even. Uh, it reaches all the world. It reaches both man and beast, the scripture says. Look at Romans 1.16. Also speaks to this. Uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to who? To everyone who believes. Both high and low. Everyone who believes. First to the Jew, which again, you know, uh, it, it, the Jews were, cons they were God's chosen people. But not just to the Jew, also to the Greek. To everyone. To all human beings, high and low, both man and beast, the depths of his love are immeasurable as well. It reaches the lowest sinner. You know, we can't escape sin. We're all born with sin. And even if we weren't, we would choose to sin. We, we do not naturally choose God. We choose our own way. And all of us, we've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There's no way to escape it. The only hope is that we can be cleansed from it. That's really our only hope. Thankfully, God has provided a way for us to be cleansed from sin through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. Again, both high and low among men find refuge, shelter in the shadow of your wings. Romans 5.8 tells us that God proves his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, we can't escape sin. But while we were still sinners, what did Christ do? Christ died for us. And 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient. Why is he patient? Not wanting any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. God loves the whole world, and he wants all to experience his love through Jesus Christ. And here's a truth that should comfort all of us. 
No one is outside of the reach of God's love, and no one is too far gone for God to love. Where are you at this morning? I mean, do you feel like what you've done is, is just too bad, that God could never love somebody like you? Do you feel like maybe you're outside of his reach? You've waited too long, or you've done too much, or you're too old, or, or, or too young, or whatever. Well, the truth is, no one is too far gone. Um, no one is outside of the reach of God's love. He loves the whole world. And he loves each individual as if they were the only person to love. He loves us. It is special. It is, it is unique. And, and that's the quote that I just shared from Augustine. Uh, I'll read it word for word. God loves each one of us as if there were only one of us to love. I mean, and that if you have experienced God's love, you know that to be true. You, you, you can't imagine how anybody could be loved the same way because it is so rich and it is so abundant and it is so unique and personal, yet God relates to each one of his children in just that way. His love is immeasurable and the abilities of his love are unimaginable, inescapable. Once you're his, you're his forever. Once you belong to him, you are his forever. He will not let you go. And there's nothing you can do to make God not love you. God loves you anyway. But once you enter into that relationship with him, once you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ, you are his, you are redeemed, and he will not let you go. God's love is that powerful. Nothing can change his love for you. His love is powerful. It's also priceless. That's number two. God's love is priceless. Look again at verse 7. God, your faithful love is so valuable. Underline that word valuable. Faith, your faithful love is so valuable that people take refuge in the shadow of your wings. How valuable is God's love? You can't really measure how big it is. Can you measure its value? There's no way to measure its worth. He blesses us exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask and think. The abilities of God, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, to him who is able to do what to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God can do more than we could ever imagine, more than we could ever ask or think. That's his ability. So what does he choose to do with that power. Well, John 3.16 tells us. I mean, he does a lot of things, but personally for you and me, he, John 3.16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He could do anything, anything at all. And he chooses to provide salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. John Wesley said, the greatest of all is God with us. The greatest example of all <coughs> is the greatest example of love is God's giving of his son, Jesus. Let me encourage you today. If you ever doubt God's love, go back to the cross. God gave his one and only son. He gave his son so that we could be saved. Now, there are a lot of people in this world, or there are some people in this world that I love enough that I would be willing to die for. My family, my wife, my kids. Um, but I can't think of anyone that I would be willing to give either one of my sons for. I mean, think about that. I would lay down my life, but I wouldn't lay down my son's life. That's a different ball game altogether. Either one of them. My daughter's for that matter. Love you too, Gracie. <laughs> I, I mean, I would never give my kids. But God didn't spare his own son. So if you ever doubt God's love, and sometimes it's easy to do that, right? Pain, suffering, sickness, uncertainties of life. If you ever doubt God's love, go back to the cross and remember what he did. Giving his son the greatest expression of love you could ever experience. And this is what makes God's love priceless. It is priceless, which means... There's no way to measure its worth, but there's also nothing that we could pay to make us worthy. There's no amount we could pay. There's nothing we could do ever to earn God's love. 
There's, there's no price tag on God's love. It's priceless. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no man can boast. And that, that's, that's the beauty. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't put a price tag on it. You can't do anything to make yourself worthy. It is a free gift, and it's a gift that continues to give. It just keeps giving. And that's why we can say that God's love is preserving. It is priceless. It is powerful. But it also, through his love, he preserves us. He protects us. He takes care of us. Look back at verse 6. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your judgments like the deepest sea. Lord, you preserve man and beast. That word preserve, key word. You preserve both man and beast. The only reason we have life and the only reason we survive in life is because God preserves us. God, your faithful love is so valuable that people take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They are filled from abundance of your house, the abundance of your house. You let them drink from the refreshing stream. For with you is life's fountain. In your light, we see the light. So God's love, he preserves us. And then verse 8 talks about uh, how he does that. I mean, uh, we drink from his stream, the abundance of his house. Life, he, he is life's fountain. I mean, he is the, the living water. The only reason we're alive and the only reason we survive is because God provides for us. So how does he do that? Well, in love, God protects his children. You preserve man and beast. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. It speaks to God's protection, the protection that he provides, that only he can provide. It reminds me of Psalm 32, verse 7. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. God's shadow offers us better protection than all of the world's armies combined. I mean, God can protect you better than anyone, better than you can protect yourself. His power, he uses that power to save us, and he uses that power to protect us. He protects us, and in love, God provides for us, for his children. They are filled from the abundance of your house, verse 8. You let them drink from your refreshing stream. God provides for his children from the abundance of all that he has. Not just out of his grace, mercy, and love. Not just out of what he has, but in accordance to. The depths of what he has, he makes available to his children. And when we have a need, he provides for that need. In his time and in his way, it may not be all that you want, but he'll give you what you need when you need it, even if you didn't know you needed it. It kind of goes with what Paul's, uh, his advice in, in 1 Timothy six seventeen: Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. I mean, you think about that. You could take that verse and say, well, God will give me whatever I want that I can enjoy. Um, well, no, th what this is saying is that God richly provides for your needs and everything he provides, he does it, and we get to enjoy it. Because we don't deserve any of it, right? I mean, what, what does God give that we deserve? Nothing. We deserve death, separation from God for our sin. But he gives us from the abundance of his riches and everything he gives us, we have the privilege of enjoying what he gives us. We're headed next week uh, to uh, Washington, D.C., among other places. And I'm sure at some point we'll visit the Lincoln Memorial. Um, Lincoln's uh, my favorite president, uh, one of my, my favorite historical figures. Just uh, his wisdom and leadership were, were ahead of his time in many ways. Um, and, and part of the reason I enjoy him is because of, of just reading him and, and, and some of his, his quotes are just amazing. And there's a story about a guy that was trying to flatter him and, and he came up to him and he said, you know, it's in my hometown, people are saying our only hope during the midst of the Civil War, our only hope are God and President Lincoln. Well, President Lincoln's response was, well, you're half right. He said, with God, I cannot fail. Without him, 
I have no hope of succeeding. Um, that's all of us. With, with God, we cannot fail in terms of heaven's standards, of his standards. I mean, he will provide one way or the other. He will fulfill his purpose. We may fail in making mistakes, but ultimately we will succeed by his standard of measurement. And with God, we will have everything that we need in this life and through eternity because he has provided it through his son, Jesus Christ. God provides for our needs because he loves us. We cannot survive without his provision. Which brings us to the next way God loves preserves us, and that's that he produces life for us. We quoted John 3.16, and, and you know, I think just by breaking this down, maybe we can gain a new other understanding of God's love. For God, let's just break it down. That's the greatest lover of all. I mean, no one has ever loved the way that God does. So loved, that's to the greatest degree of anyone who has ever loved anyone ever. His love is perfect. So loved the world, the greatest company of people. He loves the entire world. Every human being that's ever lived, God loves. That he gave, which was the greatest act, as I just described a few minutes ago, that he gave his one and only son, which was the greatest gift ever given. No other gift measures up that whosoever, which presents the greatest opportunity because that's whoever. It's whoever. There's no, there's no condition there in terms of, of who this gift is available to. The greatest opportunity believeth. What's the requirement that we believe? The greatest simplicity. There are some people that struggle over the gospel because of its simplicity. Providing the gospel wasn't simple. Living for the Lord's not, but accepting Christ is just that simple. That we believe in him. Whoever believe in him, which is the greatest attraction, God drawing people to himself. And he does that. Should not perish, which is the greatest promise. Not even death has any hold on us anymore, if we believe. But, which is the greatest difference maker right there. Should not perish, but, what's the alternative? Well, it's a pretty good one. Have which is the greatest certainty, not you might have, not maybe or maybe not, you have eternal life, which is the greatest possession any of us could ever attain. And we don't really attain it, it's a gift. The only reason we do attain it is because God gives it to us. Through his son Jesus Christ, the greatest gift. He is the only source of eternal life. Look at John chapter 1, verse 4. John 1, 4 tells us, as a matter of fact, go ahead and turn to John chapter 1 real quick. John chapter 1, zero in on verse 4, all right? In him was life, and that life was the light of men. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now, if you look at the verses around verse 4 of John chapter 1, it becomes pretty clear that the life he's describing is both physical and spiritual. Physical... Since without him, nothing was made that has been made, verse 3, and spiritual since, verse 12 and 13, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, so not just physical, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So physical life and spiritual life. Now, if you look back at Psalm 36, verse 9, which I've already read. If you look back, it says, for with you is life's fountain. Your light will see the light. And then again, John 1, 4, in him was life. That life was the light of men. I don't think it's a stretch to say that John was thinking of Psalm 36, 9 when he wrote that. So what are we talking about? This life, it is physical life, but also spiritual life, eternal life. It's priceless. It's immeasurable. And God provides that for us. He is our source of life. We exist because he said, let there be life. He created with his hands the human life. 
At his spoken world, crea- his word, creation, came into existence. We exist because he said he wanted to create, and he did it. We have eternal life only because he said, I love you enough that I'm sending my son to pay the price that you couldn't pay. He is the source of life, and he is the sustainer of life. He preserves us, and one of the ways this is possible is because of number four, God's love is permanent. Nothing changes God's love for us. Nothing changes his love. It's permanent. Verse 10, spread your faithful love over those who know you. Your righteous, righteousness over the upright and heart. And again, that word, the book ends, hesed, faithful love, enduring, perfect, unending, eternal. Your eternal, faithful, steadfast love. Never ending. It's permanent. It's never ceasing. Psalm 136.1 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is eternal. God's love is never ceasing. It will never change and it lasts through all of eternity. It never falters. It's consistent. You know, if, if something's perfect, you can't improve on it. And God's love is perfect. It never changes. Now, we discover more of that love as we grow in him and experience him in our lives. But his love doesn't change. His love is perfect. It's consistent. Exodus 3, 14. When Moses asked God who he was, God said, I am who I am. This is what you're to tell the Israelites. He said, who am I to say who sent me? Who am I to tell them who sent me? Well, I am has sent you. What is he saying there? Well, he's saying, I am who I am. I am, I was, I am, I always will be. And God is that. He is consistent. He's never changing. He's perfect. He is who he's always been and will be who he's always been and who he is now. Revelation 21, 6. He said, it is done at the end of time. He said, he, he will say, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And everything in between, by the way. And I will give water as, as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am, I was, I am, I always will be. God is consistent and his love is consistent because God is love. And he's also never failing. You can depend on God. And that term again, hesed, unfailing love, loving kindness. In verse 10, go back to verse 5. The bookends, all of who God is, those characteristics that David's talking about, the promises that we have in him, it's bookended by his faithfulness. He's saying, you, we have all of this, and we can trust in him, and we can believe in him, and we can believe in all of this, that he is this way because of his faithful love. God is faithful. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, he never fails, nor forgets, nor falters, nor forfeits his word. To every word of threat or promise, prophecy or covenant, the Lord has exactly adhered, for he is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent faithful. It reaches to the heavens. It doesn't mean that it just goes to heaven. It means that there is no place on earth that, that you can't experience his love. There's no limits to God's love. That's the basic meaning here. There is no limit to where God's love can reach. It means that God is utterly and entirely faithful. Lamentations 3.22, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. Why do we not perish? Because of his faithful love. God's love is never failing. What an amazing source of comfort to know that the God of the universe is willing to love you and that his love never ends. It never changes. It sustains. It provides. It preserves. It protects. All of those things. In 1974, an interesting, not a good interesting really, but an interesting thing happened. There was a series of, of super tornadoes that hit. It hit over, it was 148 different tornadoes that touched down in 13 states that leave 330 people dead and more than 5,000 people injured. And within this, there was one lady by the name of Linda Speakman Yerrick. She lived in Noble County, Indiana. She lived in a mobile home park, not a good place to be in a tornado. 
And she was in her mobile home, taking a shower of all things, when and there was no warning, the tornado hits, she felt the mobile home lifting up off the ground, so ran as fast as she could out the front door. I imagine not stopping to get dressed, but that was not what she was worried about at the moment, right? As fast as she could out the front door and dove next to her car, the only place she could find that was any sort of protection other than that mobile home. That was as far as she got. She just fell next to her car. And she sat there and watched with her husband inside the trailer. The trailer lifted up off the ground and then sat down right on top of where she was. Here's the thing, though. It didn't land on top of her, it landed on top of the car and the ground and there was a little V-shaped alcove where she, was set, she sat safe and sound. Her husband had serious injuries, survived but had serious injuries. She just had a few scrapes and bruises. And it just goes to show you something very important. Shelter is everything. Shelter is everything. If you've got a storm coming and you don't have shelter, you're in trouble. If you know, you're facing some sort of danger, protection. If you're playing football or some, you know, some of you are going to watch the, the Super Bowl later, if those guys don't have the proper equipment, they're in trouble. Protection. Shelter is everything. And what we read about in Psalm chapter 36 is that what distinguishes followers of Christ, what distinguishes God's people from those who don't know him, it's not our works. Yes, our works show others that we belong to him, but what distinguishes Christians from non-Christians is that we have found shelter in the shadow of his wings. We have found shelter from life and for eternity through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Shelter is everything. So have you taken shelter? That phrase, take refuge or take shelter, take refuge, it's the idea of somebody fleeing. Uh, In biblical times, Old Testament times, uh, they would have places, refuge, where if somebody committed manslaughter, they could go to 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 avoid uh, retribution from the family of the life that was taken. It was still bad and there were still consequences, but they could take refuge. If you look, yesterday's CBR journal reading, Psalm 57, 1, this was a pretty popular phrase of David's. He's running for his life from Saul. He doesn't know. He knows God's promise he's going to be king. He believes God's going to protect him, but he doesn't know how, and he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. He's running for his life, and he says, Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. Because David knew, that's why he wrote it in Psalm 57, that's why he writes it here. He knew that no matter what was going on around him, that as long as he took refuge in God, that he would be okay. You you look at, at, at today's passage. And it's really not sure, no one's really sure whether or not it was written while he was running from Saul or later when Absalom was trying to take the kingdom away from him, and his life was threatened then. But it doesn't really matter, does it? In each case, he was facing someone who wanted to wipe him out. And, and with some, some pretty large resources, the armies of Israel had gone with Absalom. Saul was king at the time, had resources at his disposal. Pretty overwhelming odds. But David says, I know I'm safe because I've got shelter. I've taken refuge in the shadow of your wings, and there's more protection in the shadow of God's wings than all of the world's armies combined. David knew that the enemy that he faced was subtle. He knew that it was powerful, and he wasn't going to become dependent upon himself. What a blessing it is to be in the safety of God's protection. You know, David prayed. He, he talks about all the blessings that we have in God. And he prays that the Lord would, would bless his people, to con- that he would continue to bless his people in verse 10. And then if you look ahead at verses 11 and 12, he, he, that, that God would one day judge the wicked. He was confident in that. God will continue to bless. David knew that God would continue to bless him as long as he was faithful. 
And God will continue to bless us as long as we are faithful. David knew the enemy's great, but God is greater. His protection is greater. And and because of all that we've just read about, the love of God, the characteristics, the blessings of God, the promises that we have, David was able, regardless of his circumstances, was able to look to the future with comfort and confidence, with peace. No matter what happened, he was protected. And you and I can have that same confidence. And and here's the key. If you don't have peace, you don't have assurance. It's probably one of two reasons. One is that you don't know Jesus Christ, and if you don't know him, he's the only way to be saved. He's the only way to have assurance and peace in this life and eternal life after this life is over. But if you do have Christ and you're struggling with peace and assurance, then are you obeying God daily? Are you walking in relationship with him? Are you growing in your relationship with him? Are you depending on truly, truly, Again, look at David's words. I know my life is being threatened, but I trust you. I take refuge in you. Remember, shelter is everything. So where are you taking shelter? Do you have protection? Because God says, you come to me and I'll provide it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all that you provide, your grace, your mercy, your love. Your, your power, your resources are unlimited. And with that, you choose to provide life, to provide sustenance in life, to give us what we need from day to day, and to preserve our lives now and through eternity. But the only way we experience that is if we trust in you for salvation. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here today who hasn't experienced that refuge, forgiveness of sin, only available through your son Jesus, that, that, that during this time of invitation, commitment, they would come and allow me to share with them how to make the most important decision they will ever make in their lives. Father, I pray that, that you would speak to our hearts and, and, and help us to evaluate Where are we looking for wisdom and guidance and and protection? Are we depending on you from day to day? Are we truly trusting in you, taking refuge in you? Are we trying to do it on our own? Are we trying to meet our own needs? Are we trying to figure out our lives on our own? Lord, I I, I pray that you would speak to us now, that we would respond however you would have us to respond. It could be an issue of obedience, trust, faith, it could be church membership. You're, you're asking individuals to be a part of this church, or maybe there are those here today who have trusted you, but they've never followed in obedience to be baptized. Uh, a display of our trust and faith in you and what you've done in our lives. Lord, whatever you would have us to do, I pray that we would do it and be faithful as you are always, ever faithful. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?